you know, that have these 660, I have a 700 over here, or 685cc Mako, 620, and I have the 700 Zabel engine, but it's not actually the largest that uh, has ever been made. Yeah, a long time ago, someone made a... So today we're going to talk about the story of the Mako 760. But first, let's introduce you to the International Six Days Trials, or the ISTT, which was one of the oldest off-road motorcycle events that's still active today. But today it's known as ISTE. Originally started back in 1913 in Carlisle, England. This was a trial of endurance for both the rider and the motorcycle. They must compete over grueling terrain for six days, which is enough to shatter most motorcycles to pieces, especially those older ones that were, you know, <laughs> back then. The rider and the bike have to pull together to compete this course. So they both got to be in tip-top shape, you know, to be able to get through this course even, let alone finish it. As you can imagine, riding six days on any sort of surface is going to be hard. But on rough terrain, such as we will ride in the six days, it's very, very demanding on the body. The arms, legs, neck, very, very demanding. You see a lot of moss and rushes. It's obviously going to be wet and soft. If it's stony, it's obviously going to be rocks close to the surface. So you've got to keep all these sort of things in mind. And if you're riding in the forest, you've got to be keeping an eye open for sticks and logs about the floor, you know, because unless you've seen it before you come to it, it's surely going to bring you off brings us down to 1969. So BMW was introducing the R75 slash 5, you know, which was being built out of a new factory they had in Berlin, Germany. Paul Hanneman, the director of BMW, was looking for someone who could ride the factory prototypes in the ISDT. Herb Schick and Kurt Distler both had signed up. Now, BMW had 148 FM gold medals, and, and the director, he wanted to make it even 150. So he was counting on them to bring back two gold medals. However, there were problems. And Herb would later say, when asked why he had not prepared four machines if he wanted was two gold medals, he reacted with astonishment that anyone could doubt the success of BMW. Now, this is motorcycle would fail, and so only Herb had brought back a gold medal. In the early 1970s, two strokes were catching up to the four strokes with larger displacement engines, 500 and up, such as the Mako 501 and eventually the Mako 504. And Herb Schick noticed that these bikes were just too heavy to compete, even against British single. And he said, we need to slim these things down to 150 or 160 kilograms. BMW responded, that's impossible. Herb Schick said, well, I'll build my own. BMW supplied the materials to Herb specifications, and he was able to reduce the machines down to 135 kilograms at first and later to 125 kilograms. These were known as the Schick BMWs. Now, once again, BMW would enter the ISDT in 1973, which took place in the United States. And BMW went to put in a big show for the American market. They had a larger display than any other motorcycle at the event. And this year, BMW had returned to the ISDT with a four-man team. However, Herb was irritated with BMW's handling of the event. The motorcycles themselves were plagued with issues. And while Herb would win a gold medal, this experience led BMW shutting down its off-road team. Again. three... BMW had ended up closing shop on their uh, ISDT race team. You know, the early 70s, the two strokes were lighter, they were more agile, they were getting bigger displacement, and around 76, 75, even Mako and KTM had released their ISDT bikes, the 504s. In fact, you can see in this old magazine here from 76, which actually does talk about the Mako and the KTM 504. You can see here the uh, Mako 504 and uh, the KTM, which I believe was also a 504. But, um, but yeah, uh, so they were going up and they were racing in the up to 750 class. So, and actually uh, Herb Schlick himself raced a Mako 504 and the ICT Alabama in 1975, and he won that championship. In fact, Herb actually won more championships on a Mako than he did on BMW. In 1978, the German championship had announced an off-road sport class of over 750cc for the coming season. And BMW wanted to use this opportunity to get back into off-road sport. 
This effort was headed by Laszlo Perez, who would build this machine to go and compete in the German Off-Road Championship. However, he wasn't the only one who was interested in this new rule change. This would be Rolf Witthof, who was a many times over champion and had retired in 1976, opening his own Kawasaki shop. Hearing this rule, he decided to enter back into off-road competition and build his own Kawasaki over 750 off-road machine. He took a 1977 Kawasaki 750, boarded it over to a 751, and built this bike into an off-road chassis. Rolf beat BMW's team, and so BMW hired him for 1979. Now, Rolf had won in the uh, German Off-Road Championship, but I do have the ISTT 1978 uh, pamphlet here. And when I looked through this pamphlet to see who was racing in this year in, in the ISTT, uh, especially in the 750 class, not the over 750 class, because that wasn't in the ISTT until 1979, but who was racing in the up to 750 class. Well, looking at this list, we have both Laszlo Perez and Herb Schick both riding a Mako in the up to 750 class. Now, we have everybody here is pretty much on Mako, except for the guy on the overboard MZ, which that guy actually won this event. Uh, we also have Egbert Haas, who's actually riding for the Mako factory, Haas came in second, and of the East German, he said he's happy for his success, and he's simply a better driver than I am. Summer of 1978, Haas had the idea of entering into the over 750 class, coming in 1979 to the ICT and the European Enduro Championship. The problem was that Haas was a Mako rider, and Mako did not make a large displacement that would be able to ride in that class. So he thought to himself that he would simply have to build his own. There were several complications to this project. Everyone said it was impossible. It was impossible to build a 750cc two-stroke. Not even the Mako engineers thought that this would be possible. In fact, BMW's Helmut Bunch said the idea of building such an engine can only come from someone who doesn't know that it's not possible. Haas's response to this being an impossible project, an impossible bike by the Mako engineers, and the general consensus that you know, a 750cc plus two-stroke would be not only impossible to build, but impossible to get running right, he said, that's probably true. I mean, what do I know? After all, I'm just a painter. Who are you? Are you, are you like some special forces guy or something? I'm just a cook. Now, he considered that this bike would likely have less power than the BMWs, however, the light chassis should be able to give him an advantage over the more heavy, clunky competition. Now, the problem is that he then broke his leg at the end of the season in 1978, and so the doctor said he had to take a one-year break, and so that ended his plan to create this 752 stroke. Well, immediately after his injury, he didn't really want to ride again. However, after some time, he did get the urge again, and so he wanted to enter the 79 uh, Enduro competitions, and so he contacted a friend of his to see if he could borrow his Schick BMW. And he said yes, so Egbert entered next year's competition with the BMW. In this entry, we're just currently on paper, because the race wasn't for several months yet. So after he got the okay to borrow the BMW, he registered for competitions, ICT, you know, European Off-Road Championships, and not too long before the race, that offer got rescinded. And now he was stuck. And so he was like, now I definitely have to build that bike, and I don't have much time. Haas just got a big block of aluminum for a cylinder and another block for a piston. And he had a friend who was a machinist that had a lathe in in his basement and they used that to turn the solid aluminum into a cylinder and then they milled out the ports and channels by hand. Uh, they had either used a Mako 504 or 440. I've seen references to both of these. However, the, it's basically the same stroke was an 83 millimeter stroke and he created a 109 millimeter bore in order to give him over 750 cc. Haas finished the motorcycle a week before the race, and so the first startup was the Wednesday before the race. And he later said he always kept a pocket full of jets in case he needed to tweak something. Now, when Haas showed up at the event, he had originally entered under riding a BMW. It was a big surprise when he shows up with a Mako. They asked him if it was a 760, and he said, actually, it's a 775. This stole the show away from BMW. This is actual footage from that event in 1979. 
European Enduro Championships. And this was the BMW's works team that they had put together. All of these riders were riding against Haas, as well as Kurt Disla on a Yamaha 800. Australian Dirt Bike Magazine in 1979 had this to say, with the 54th ICT held on German soil in September, the Munich firm of BMW entered a strong bid for championship honors within the over 750cc class. The last time the factory ran the big twins was in the 1973 ICT in the USA. That was in the over 500cc class, and at the time, big board two-stroke singles were just beginning to show themselves to be feasible. 501, Mako's, Jawa, Husqvarna. That class is now a 750 class. And now with the introduction of the new class, BMW sponsored development program saw the Munich machines take only minor placings last year to a 760cc Kawasaki twin written by Rolf Withoff many times German and European champion. And they were able to lure Rolf away from Kawasaki to lead a three-man factory team. Haas's bike would make 30 horsepower at 4,000 RPM. In the press, Haas's bike became known as the Super Mako. And it was 775 cc's with a 109 millimeter bore. Haas likened riding the Mako to that of riding a Lance Bulldog, which is a tractor that makes, you know, 35 to 45 horsepower at less than uh, 700 RPM. It's pretty cool, right? Now, what if we put it in gear? In one of the early tests, the Mako had stalled, and this had prevented, likely prevented Haas from getting the class win for that day. Uh, and Disla took the win, and Haas took second place, leaving the BMWs in third place and beyond. However, Haas eventually won the overall European Championship for over 750cc. And here is Haas holding the championship trophy. Uh, then a lot of articles started showing up about the Super Mako and how Haas just shows up, you know, at this race event with the Super Mako and then beats BMW and steals the show. Years later, Haas had reflected on this event and he said the following, BMW had invested almost a million into the race and I beat them all with my own construction. That was crazy. The Mako company was delighted with the victory and the success was undoubtedly Good advertising. Haas's 775 was shown in a museum a few years ago. Well, actually 10 years ago now in Germany. And uh, they had this poster here that says the impossible. And it says the commitment and inventiveness of Mako employees was astonishing. From the doubled Mako called Opio to the successful Super Mako of Egbert Haas. Engineers competitors thought it was impossible so the engine could work. The immediate success and victory in 1979 at the European Championships in the over 750cc class in off-road sports proved the opposite. Well, the aftermath of this was that the European Championship in 1980 created an over 1,000 class for the four strokes, and then the 750 became the up to 1,000 class. And then after that, they pretty much abolished both those classes for just the over 500 class. After 1980 or 81, BMW had left uh, the Enduro Sport and slowly started focusing on Dakar with the release of their R80 GS. This is Haas showing the difference between a CR500 piston and a Mako 760 piston. No, I'm just joking. That's a 50cc piston. So, is that it? Is that the end of the story? The BMW spent millions of dollars to build this bike, the GS80. In the 78, Rolf came in with his own built to, uh, 751 Kawasaki, and he beat them in the German Championships. Then 79, in the European Enduro Championships, Haas came in with his own built 775cc two-stroke, which everybody thought was impossible to build, and he also beat BMW, and he won that championship. Now, BMW um, and Haas also raced in the ISTT, though, in 79. And the ICT, I believe, took after the um, uh, European Championship. I think the European Enduro that they were at the, in, the, in the videos was around April or so. I believe the ICT took place in September. Now, when Haas showed up to the ICT, he didn't have the same bike. He had a different bike. So this is Haas in 1979 in the ISTT as number 490. That engine looks a lot different than this one here from this magazine picture of it from the previous run in the European Enduro. The cylinder on this bike looks very much like a Mika 501 as compared to what Haas was riding in the previous races. This magazine is from 1980, but the bottom of this magazine is written Factory Mako. So I believe that after Haas won, they actually created a factory Mako with the 501 heads. So it looks like in the 1979 ISTT, Haas showed up with a factory Mako with the 501 head.
So in the 79 ISDT, these are the racers who were in there. Haas is actually number 490. So you can see his bike right here. And this is some footage of the event. And so Mako had definitely made a factory version of what Haas had made. And in their version, they used a 501 cylinder to create it. Now, there, there isn't too much information around this time about when they made these engines and why they made them. I mean, I can speculate that's because Haas made his own and, and won the event, and so then they decided to make these engines, but there's really no information about that particular thing. Now, we know for a fact they made them. There's there's definitely uh, magazine articles and stuff like that talk about the Mako factory engines, but there's no documentation, or there's no connection between when Haas won the event and them, right, and them creating this engine, and then Haas using using this engine in this ICT. I can just see that he used it in this ICT. But otherwise, there's no information about it. And what I mean by this, whenever I see Haas's interviews, he never says, oh yeah, I won the event, and then Mako decided to create these, and then they had me ride them as a factory rider. I've not seen that documentation. And so, now I know I can see he did it, but you know, there's no connection between these two. There's no connection that says, okay, now Mako's decided to make these bikes and then race in all these races. I can see they did, but, you know, Haas didn't say, okay, this is how this happened. So if anyone has information on how that happened, I'd be interested. So these are the results that we have for the uh, European Enduro Championship. We can see in 79 that Haas had won the up over 700, over 750 cc. And then 1980, they changed it to up to 1,000 cc and then um, over 1,000 cc, which was named a 1,300 cc class. And we can see in 1980, Rolf actually won it. And it looks like Haas came in second with Manfred coming in third. And Manfred was also on a 760cc Mako. This was written about the 1980 ICT, and it does prove my point that I had said before. So the BMWs used to be 750s, and as a result, the class used to be a virtual benefit for them, the over 500 class. But then people started making big bore two strokes, that is the Mako 501, 504, you know, KTM, and whatnot. And BMW had to move up if they were to maintain their elitism. This time, they were being challenged even in that monster league, as Mako turned up with two 780cc two stroke singles. So let's say you showed up on Mako's in the over 750 class of 1980. We see we have two people on this list, 47 and 48, who are on Mako 760s. And if you look at the results, Manfred actually won in first place for the 1980 ISDT. Pretty much the, the story of the Mako 760. Haas built it. He, he won the Enduro Championship. Mako apparently built a bunch, you know, a few at least for ISDT and other off-road Enduro competitions at the time that were for over 750. A few different riders, at least three different riders on them, you know, including um, Haas himself. And they ran it in the ISDT and in, in European uh, Enduro Championships, you know, in 79 and in 1980. Um, it looks like after 1980, the class was pretty much killed off. And again, BMW went to work on the car and focus on the car rather than do, you know, enduro events anymore. And um, Mako went bankrupt in 83. The only thing left here is to talk about the Super Hunky article. I'm sure I got a lot of comments saying that Super Hunky wrote an article about it. And he did. And in fact, he's rewritten the wording of it several times over the years. I remember the first time I saw it was like 20 years ago. He put it on his website in like 2004 or something like that. But, um, you know, he, he, his, the article is only about his experience at Blackwater, and he even said in one of the versions of it that you know, the Mako people there didn't tell much about it. They just saw this, he just saw his big bike, and they just said, oh, it's just for a ride nice to ATT and, you know, or 750 glass, and, you know, they won some gold medals and stuff like that. And his first couple of paragraphs really don't really, you know, talk too much. They don't really explain what actually happened. It's just a very, you know, very broad summary of what the bike actually was. He does give the technical details of the version of the bike he had though, which is a 250 bottom end, you know, the 108, you know, um, CC uh, piston. And uh, I forget the stroke, I'd look at it, but I remember he said it was like a 753 CC, that, that particular bike that he, he had. So I didn't talk about that, but I figured I would bring it up because I'm gonna get 100 people in the comments mentioning that, even though I've seen that in an article 100 times. So the question is, what happened to the maker of that super hunky road? And I'll say that a few years ago, like 10, 15, probably 15 years ago, it was for sale in Alabama. There was a bunch of pictures of it going around, and uh, it was on sale for $50,000. Um, several people thought about buying it. Um, eventually, uh, one person bought it. Um, I, I've seen it. I know that they have restored it. They have even had it signed by Super Hunky. It's in really good condition. But uh, 
depth. I'm not going to disclose where it is or who has it in this video. So, but uh, but yeah, it, it's actually still around and it's running. So so yeah, that's uh, all I have for the history of the Mako 760.